more to you. This week we are continuing in our Squishy series that we started about two weeks ago. Um, this series will run for a total of about eight weeks. Um, as Pastor Mike did the introduction around how do we be good stewards over our time, our talents, our treasure, and our temple. Um, Pastor Teddy came last week and was talking about time and being able to make good decisions about time and all that kind of good stuff. But today we're going to be talking more about talent. You may not hear the word talent all that much in the sermon, but just know that when I say gifts <laughs> or serving, it's talent. Amen? Amen. So um, we're going to look at two passages of scripture, but the main passage of scripture this morning comes from Luke. Chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, it's a parable, um, which were stories that Jesus told in order to teach a lesson. And um, if you are in the Bible, in the, the church Bible is page 838, um, or we'll get it on the screen. It reads as follows. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well, it's well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, page 933 in your Bibles. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not one of those turn to your neighbor preachers, but this morning I want you to say, can we say together, common good. Common good. Amen. Make sure that sticks in your psyche. Common good. Amen. So this morning we're going to be talking about potential. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. God, you brought us to this particular moment in worship. And may we not bring any less reverence to this moment than we bring to any other part of our time with you. So Lord, please bless our ears that we may listen reverently. Our hearts that we may receive. Our minds that we may process. And our bodies that as we make decisions, we may act accordingly in a way that makes you happy and that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So an electrical outlet or receptacle has all of the potential for energy, okay? But it's called potential energy because it's dormant. It doesn't become kinetic energy or energy that moves or that powers something until you plug something into it and it is transferred from the outlet to that item and then you can turn it on. Okay, so there's a difference between potential energy, the possibility of something, and kinetic energy, the actual use of that something. Now, if I'm honest with myself, I did not often work to my potential when I was growing up. I was a bit of a lazy child. And to give you an example, my sister and I had to take turns every other night washing dishes. Okay? And when it came my night, my mom had some very clear, defined rules and processes for washing dishes, okay? So if she cooked food, or if my grandma cooked food, or if my dad cooked food, if there was food left in the pot, she was to remove that food from the pot, put it in a smaller container, put that container in the refrigerator, and then wash those pots. Well, I hated washing pots, well, I hated washing dishes for that matter. So, I would often try to cut corners, right? And so I would take the whole pot and I just put it in the oven. <laughs> or I would put it in the refrigerator. So then when my mom and my grandma would walk in, it would present the illusion as if I had completely cleaned the whole kitchen. 
Now, it was short-lived because all they could do is open the refrigerator and after a while, you know, a couple of times of opening the oven the next day and realizing that I put food in there that was now spoiled. That's the first thing they did when they came in after I washed the dishes. So I would always have to go back and do it the right way, right? So I had the potential to do it the right way the first time, but because I didn't want to do it, I would always try to cook them. Now that I'm older and more mature, I can honestly say that after I have taught and coached and mentored young people, that there is probably possibly nothing more frustrating than seeing someone have the ability to do something, the capacity, and they're not able to do it for whatever reason. Or they're unable to do it to the fullest extent. And so this is where we find ourselves, this fig tree, in our parable today. Jesus has been teaching to several people who have gathered around, and he tells this parable of a fig tree where the owner of a vineyard has planted a fig tree in his yard, and he comes to the vineyard in order to, to get figs off of this fig tree. But when he gets there, the tree is figless. It's barren. And so he says to the man who has been tending his vineyard, he says, look, I have come to this vineyard, not one, not two, but three years in a row. And all three years I have come, there have been no fruit on this tree. Now, generally speaking, fig trees bear fruit twice a year, in the winter and in the summer, but only the fruit that is bare in the summer is edible. So we can assume that he's in the summertime right now, looking for fruit that he can eat. So the guy who is the caretaker of the vineyard, he says to him, he says, well, you know, just, you know, Give it some more time. He says, no. He says, I don't want to give it some more time. He says, it is taking up good soil and good space and it's not contributing the way it needs to contribute. Cut it down. He says, just give it one more year. He said, let me tend to it. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. And then if it hasn't produced fruit, cut it down. Now, the fact that the, the caretaker is able to actually reach a place where he's willing to cut the tree down if it doesn't respond, right? to caring for it means that there is a portion or a place in which even if we are constantly nurtured, constantly discipled, constantly poured into, that there is a point in which we have to produce or we lose the ability to do so. All right? And so this is a very tenuous kind of parable, one that's a little um, agitated if you will. Now, fig trees were often used to represent the children of Israel biblically. And, but what we know about God is that no matter how many times they screwed up, no matter how many times they didn't live into their potential, God always gave them another opportunity to do so. And God does the same with us. But what does it say about being in an environment and a space where you have the ability and the opportunity to produce, to use your gifts, to serve, <laughs> And you are in a space where the space needs what you have. But for whatever reason, you can't seem to give it. This idea of always taking, but never giving. When I was in college, my two roommates and I um, sat down, we had a meeting because they had a friend who um, was having a difficult time financially. They were like, okay, Donna, we really want to give her an opportunity to stay here for a little while so she can find a perfect place. And I said, okay, that's fine. So we knew coming in that she could not contribute to rent. We knew that she could not contribute to bills, right? Cool. Neither did we ask her to, you know, clean the house and, you know, do all this cooking and stuff. We didn't ask her to do something to earn her keep, right? Just the expectation that you would at least take care of your space, right? So the sister comes in. She eats the food that we bring into the house. She brings her boyfriend over mm. <laughs> to eat the food that we brought into the house. See, some of y'all college students, I want y'all to hear this. <laughs> she doesn't pick up after herself. The dishes that she dirty, she leaves in the sink. She does not wash. So I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to have a house meeting. We sit down, we have a house meeting. I say, now look, I said, now, we need for you to do at least the bare minimum of a contribution to the household for being in this place. Just a bare minimum, right? She's okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. But the cycle continues, she still did the same thing, right? And so what we found was that her inability to do 
what she already had the capacity to do just on a basic level. Not only did she withhold from us something that could have been a contribution to us, but she burdened us unduly. So when we look at this parable today, we look at this passage, what we're talking about is not necessarily that God or the church or a community or wherever you're serving cuts people off because they aren't producing fruit. The whole issue is that there is something about people being in a space who are gifted and those gifts are necessary to that space. So not only are we denying people something that they need that we have, but those who are serving and producing in that space, it puts an undue burden on them for others to not contribute. That's what this parable is about. It's not about cutting people off. It's not about kicking people out, right? It's about when we are not good stewards over what God has given us, it puts a stress on the entire community and we are less productive. This first Corinthians passage says that there are many gifts, there are many activities, there are a variety of all of them. But all of them come from one God, from one Spirit, that each of us has a manifestation of the Holy Spirit to do what? Work towards the common good. And here's where we kind of get off, especially in the West. It's this understanding that, you know, what I have, I have to make a living off of. Yes, there are gifts that you have that you use daily. That yes, you should be able to make a living off of because this world operates off of money, right? But these gifts were not necessarily granted to you by God for your own personal good. It was for the common good. Why? Because if we are working in common good, then I don't have to be overly concerned about whether or not I'm getting what I need because the rest of the community has provided that for me. As I provide for them what I have that they need. So it may do us a good service to spend like the next few minutes just looking at this fig tree. And I want to look at just three possibilities as to why this fig tree may have been in an environment and a place where it had the ability and the capacity to produce, to serve, to give, but it couldn't manage. Just three. There are many reasons, okay? But it's just three. And then it's 10 till 12. 10 till 11, so we still doing good. Y'all gonna be in the kitchen, y'all's chicken. Put y'all in there, amen? So the first reason this fig tree may not be producing is because it could have been procrastinating. It could have been Procrastinating, procrastinating to delay, to um, to be late, especially when there is an immediate need for something. So the act of procrastination is this idea that we actually look for distractions in order to avoid doing something that we should really be doing, right? And sometimes it comes because you know we really don't like the task that we have to do, or we really would rather be doing something else. But in our case today, I think ways of looking at procrastination. For example, sometimes we procrastinate in doing something that is a challenging task simply because of our own ignorance or because we've never tried that thing before. We believe that it's going to be harder than what it actually is. And so we think that we don't want to do it or won't like it, but it's not based upon anything that we've ever experienced because we've never done it before. Give me an example. Because that's what I do. I give examples. I can remember the first time Deji and I gave Kaya our daughter broccoli tea. So she sits down, she looks at the broccoli, and she decides immediately that she doesn't like broccoli. <laughs> but Kaya knows that she can't get ice cream unless she eats her broccoli. So she sits there, she looks at it, she waits, she stalls, she tries to distract us. It doesn't work. We say, no, if you don't eat your broccoli, you can't get ice cream. Deji and I finish our meal, we get our own bowls of ice cream, sit down at the table. Her and get our ice cream in front of her. <laughs> Finally, her desire for ice cream wins out. She tastes her broccoli only to discover that she likes it. <laughs> and she asks for seconds. So she wasted all this time, <laughs> right? Trying not to eat the broccoli that she had never tasted before, only to discover that she liked it. See, sometimes you all, we say no and we don't do what we are pressed to do because we have an assumption about what that thing is and we've never even tried it. Only to discover that after we get in it, the benefits are well beyond anything we could ever imagine. But then there are other times that 
we procrastinate, who we know that we will like what the outcome is. But the process of getting to the outcome is what we don't like. Right? Now, I've been doing some form of public speaking since I was like nine or 10, okay? And I love it. I love this. Does it seem like I don't love this? <laughs> right? I love this. It's like the air that I breathe. But the process of preparing is gruesome for me. After, you know, I mean, you talk about 12, 13, 14 years of doing this, the process has not gotten easier for me. Right? I'm a slow writer. It takes a lot of prayer, most times a lot of fasting, right? A lot of study, a lot of mental energy is expended into this, right? And so the process isn't necessarily something that I run towards, but you best believe that I learned this very early. The one time I procrastinated and put it off and tried to avoid it and I rushed to prepare the last minute, I realized that it was a mistake. Right? It was horrible. And so the very part that I loved, I never got to. And it didn't just hurt me, but it hurt those that I was called to be present with, right? And to speak to. Why? Because I procrastinated and did not go through the process. Now, I know that serving and giving up your gifts and giving up your time, especially in a voluntary nature, right, is not something that seems overly appealing. All right? It requires a commitment of time. It requires an accountability to grow. Right? But what I can say is that the benefits of serving in a space far outweigh any struggles it may be to make that commitment and to yield to accountability. And there are things that you have inside of you that people need that they are being denied because you're withholding them. Now, I know we're busy. People are busy. People you know, got their own issues, they got plenty of things going on, and unfortunately this world tells us that um, that we are to be misused, that people are supposed to trample over us if we commit our time right here. But what would it look like if a hundred people, right, committed to doing some form of service every other month, as opposed to 25 people committing every month or every Sunday or every week or every day to do something, right? Do we see the, the disparity and the stress on the community? So we see that when more people are operating as God has called them to within their gifts and within this mindset of serving, then it what? It relieves the stress on the entire community. So maybe this big tree was just fascinating. And I hope he gets it together because if he doesn't, or she, <laughs> right? In a year, if he has not produced, he will lose the capacity completely to produce fruit at all. Second reason is that this tree may not be producing fruit because this tree might be pretending. Yeah, he, he or she might be pretending. In case you didn't notice, this is a fig tree in a vineyard. Now, it wasn't all that odd for people to, to plant fig trees in vineyards during this time um, for any various reasons, but as you can imagine, a fig tree would stick out pretty poignantly amidst, amidst vines of grapes, right? And so I can imagine that, you know, this fig tree might be looking around talking about, you know, everybody else is grapes, and I'm supposed to be producing figs, Well, maybe I need to just produce grapes or act like I should. Right? Maybe he's trying to be like the grapes around him as a means of being accepted, right? And not being singled out, not being different, right? Of being affirmed. And there's a Aesop's um, fable, one of my favorites is called the Jackdaw and the Pigeon. And a Jackdaw is just a black crow, okay? And it goes like this and there was a Jackdaw and he was looking at some pigeons eating their food, and he became very envious of how well they were fed. And so he decided that he was going to paint his feathers white and join them so that he could eat like they eat. And so he does. He paints his feathers white and he eats and he just eats to his heart's delight and everything was fine until he started chattering. When he opened his mouth to talk, they realized he is not a pigeon. And they began to peck him unmercifully. So much so that he runs back to his own jackdaws, but they don't recognize him because he has white feathers. 
and they kick him out, and he becomes a homeless wanderer. Right? There is this concept that if this fig tree did not want to be seen as a fig tree, the last thing he wants to do is produce figs. But if he is pretending to be a vine, eventually he's going to be expected to produce grapes. The problem is he's not a vine, and he doesn't have the capacity to produce grapes. You see, sometimes we are confused about where our own unique gifts and skill sets fit into a place. And then there are other times when we have compared ourselves to other people and their gifts so much that we have devalued our own gifts that God has given us. But we are not in this world, of this world. This world says that greatness and success comes by uh, people who look a certain way and who act a certain way and who have a certain level of power. And the truth of the matter is many of the leaders and the celebrities of our world are often pushed and pressed to not be who they really are in an effort to leave this facade of who they should be. And so if we are pretending to be like them or anyone else, we are probably pretending to be like people who are pretending themselves. But God says, no, I endow you with a gift. It is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That means that there's no person in this building right now who has not been given a gift by God and has been given the power to become a part of the priesthood of believers to do ministry that is specific to what God has called you to. God sometimes places us in positions and in places because our uniqueness is exactly what that place needs. And if you are not operating in that, you are not only denying that place what it needs, but you are saying no to God. You're saying, God, you messed up in how you get it. You screwed this up. You got it wrong. I was supposed to be able to sing. <laughs> right? <laughs> you all out of key and out of tune and focus like, well, please just sit down. <laughs> right? I was supposed to be able to preach, right? Because we value some gifts over others. But I'm saying to you now, it is the same spirit, it is the same God, it is the same Lord. And if your gift is missing, the community is suffering. So yes, maybe this tree was pretending. The third thing that this tree may have been doing, the reason he was not producing fruit or she was maybe he had a little bit too much pride. He had a little bit too much pride. Pride, haughtiness, arrogance. Now I find it very hard to believe that this caretaker had been ignoring this fig tree for three years. If he was willing to invest another year digging and pruning and maturing this tree to get it to produce, it's probably because he had already invested a lot of time and energy into helping this tree to start with. Right? Have you ever had somebody believe in you when you didn't believe in yourself? Right? Somebody say that you can when you said, no, I can't. Yeah. Right? Who seemed like they were putting in more effort than you for you to be successful. <laughs> like, man, why are you trying so hard? <laughs> right? So I find it hard to believe that this caretaker all of a sudden, this is just the only time that he's ready to pour into this fig tree. Which means that this fig tree either had been ignoring the work that this caretaker had been doing or had been rejecting it. Now, I know that there are many reasons why this tree would be rejecting the caretaker. Maybe he was caught up in his own thoughts, his own pain, his own issues. But it is nevertheless true that he still has a choice to make in this, in this moment. And that choice was to not accept how he was being helped. So we've already mentioned that giving and serving and being a good stewardship steward over your talents requires a commitment of time. The more people who commit, the less that commitment of time will be, right? It requires an accountability to grow, okay? But it also requires a desire to learn. A desire to learn and be taught. A good friend of mine sent his nephew to college at Shaw where I was working a few years back, and 
Um, he had saved up all this money. He and his mom had saved up all this money to send his nephew to school. But he says, Don, I really want you to um, please work with him, make sure that he's successful. I said, I will do everything I possibly can as long as he is willing, you know, to accept my help with good. Right? Brother goes to class. Um, or at least we think he's going to class. Check in with him, how are things going? Oh, things are going great, it's better than I expected. I mean, I am believing his brother. It's like on a straight A, four point oh, break point track, right? <laughs> Only to discover, mid semester, that his, his GPA is well below a 2.0, okay? I'm not even sure there was a one in front of the point. <laughs> I mean, sure, they ain't going to class, right? And so I say, look, 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 let me send you to the tutoring center, right? Let me give you a time management sheet. Let me show you how to do it. Let me follow up with you every week, right? If you're really willing to do this, I know you have the capacity, let's do it, right? He says, okay, 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 we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. Came to me every week, sat down with me every week, and still did not go to class. Was on academic probation, had to sit out the time period necessary, came back a second time and did the same thing despite all of the efforts to help. He proved himself to be unteachable. Not because he didn't have the ability or the capacity. Maybe there were some other things that were going on with him that he needed to work out. I don't know. But at some point, when you are serving in the church, in the community, on your job, wherever you are serving and you're being a good steward over what you have, right? And we always, when we serve, we always serve more than anybody can pay us. So there's always a portion of us going to be volunteer, okay? When you are serving, you have an obligation to be able to receive from others the things that can help you get better at what you do. I don't care how gifted you are, it is not enough to be gifted. It's just not enough. You gotta have discipline, you gotta have commitment, you gotta nurture that thing, you gotta grow that thing. It's not enough. And quite frankly, it is, you know, it's quite offensive to people who work really hard. <laughs> and what they do, you to float in on your gift, and clearly you haven't crafted the art of your vocation, of what God has given you to be a contribution to this world and to the communities that you're in. God will never put you in an environment or a community where you first are not receiving what you need. You're gonna receive something in that space, no matter how it comes. And there's also something you need to always give in that space, all right? So there's never gonna be an instance where those two things aren't happening. Even if it doesn't seem like you're receiving what you need, trust me, you're growing in some kind of way. Right? Even if it's you're learning what not to do. <laughs> right? You're growing. So there's always this, this give and this take with what it means to be a good steward of what you have. So with all of these things given, the potential that is within you is God-given. But in order for that potential energy to move to kinetic energy, it has to be definitely, definitely a real choice made by you requires commitment, requires discipline, and it requires a humility that says, I want other people to hold me accountable and to help me grow. And I promise you, the beautiful thing about all of this is that out of all the things that we give, God always allows us to receive blessings because of it. I mean, I can't even explain to you the blessings that come from making just small commitments to serve in the way God has asked you or called you to serve. So some of you may be wondering, okay, so what do I do as well? Can we skip two slides over, Devin, to next steps? But some of you it may be, I need to join a live group. You say, well, how does joining a live group use my gifts, right? Joining the live group is entering into a specific discipleship process where you are joining with other people to grow spiritually, right? And it is through our live groups here at the church that many things happen. Many of our live groups do service projects together. Some of them do other ministry pieces together, such as the women's 
um, group here. And so there are ways in which joining a live group is a way of being discipled and being connected to other people in an intimate way so that you gain that accountability, right? You learn more about your gifts, right? But you're also receiving exactly what God asks you to receive in the community, and that is the love and the support and a, a place to be prayerful and to reflect on your life. Connect with the leader. We have a host of leaders, live group leaders, ministry team leaders. Sometimes just sitting down and have a one, having a one-to-one -one with people who are serving regularly can help you clarify where you fit. Take an initiative. Volunteer when opportunities are announced. We're having a dinner after service next week for the anniversary. You want to serve? <laughs> it's a great opportunity. <laughs> Attend the Way 101. Um, we had several people at the Way 101 yesterday. If you haven't attended the Way 101, you've been here for a while, um, and you know that you know you really want to dig a little deeper. You know this is a good step. It happens every other month, so our next one will be in September. Take a spiritual gifts test online. There are any number of spiritual gifts tests. Go online, type in spiritual gifts test. Try to get an idea. Some of you already know. Most of you are already serving in places where you're using the gifts God has given you. You're just using them for other stuff. <laughs> Which ain't a bad thing, I'm just saying. You ain't ever using them for God. <laughs> we ain't gonna use them. So take a spiritual gifts test, all right? So these are some ways. Let's go back to the reflection questions for this week. Am I more prone to procrastinate, pretend, or be prideful? And if your answer is, I'm not prone to do any of these, you're lying. <laughs> because if I'm being honest with myself, I'm prone to do all three, given the situation in the day. It's called repentance. And God forgives. Two, what is one thing I would do that benefits others, even if I never got paid for? What is one thing that you love to do so much that if you never got paid for it, you would still have a desire to do that and you would find a way to do it? That's what I want to hear about when you be with me. Amen? And what fears or concerns do I have about making a commitment to serve? Is it that you haven't been a good steward over your time? Is it that you're maxed out? Right? Is it that you're working three or four jobs? Me. And are you isolated from that? So this stewardship series isn't just about talent. It's about being a good stewardship over your time, over your treasure, and over your body. And a part of being in community means that I am not isolated in my struggles because guess what? The community is here to help. Right? The last thing we want to do here at the Way Christian Center is ever put an undue burden on anyone. Right? We're not very demanding people here. <laughs> and we don't want to be. But we also don't want you in isolation. So really consider, what are your fears and concerns about making a commitment to serve? Yes, here at the church, but also in other places. Are there other places where you've been invited to serve? And you've been reluctant to make that commitment. What was that about? Was it that I just don't have time, I'm maxed out? What does that say about me? Can I, have a, can I say no? Right? Or is it that I'm afraid that what I have to contribute isn't good enough? Right? Do I not value the gifts that I have? Alright? Those are your reflection questions for this week.